we, uh, we want to start always with prayer. So, Father, we do ask, the Lord, that you would uh, grant us the spirit of revelation that we may know you more and uh, really understand these truths about uh, your second coming, Lord. And uh, we ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. So we are, we are into one of my favorite all-time studies. I've studied this for many years. Uh, I've called it the rapture of the saints. And uh, uh, it's, I trust that it will, uh, it, it will take us a long time. There's a lot of content but I think at the end you will be uh, have a greater understanding of what uh, the rapture of the saints actually is. And you understand, I think, from, from the beginning that when it talks about the saints, we're not talking about those that are canonized. We're talking about believers in Jesus Christ. The scriptures say if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are sanctified by the Spirit of God, set apart for holy use, and you are called by the Scriptures a saint. So when we're talking about the rapture of the saints, we're talking about you, the body of Christ, the church uh, of the living God that is one time we are going to be raptured. We'll talk more about that in a minute. The rapture of the saints will be the most glorious event in all of human history but at the same time, it will be the most terrible event for many people. It will be the most horrifying occurrence for some who have willfully chosen to refuse God's offer of a free pardon. At the moment, the free pardon is open to all. But there are some people that say, nah, not for me, thank, thank you. I'm quite happy to do things my own way. Frank Sinatra, right? I'll do things my own way. Well, Jesus, you know, when, as I look at the scriptures, I, I, I see so many passages about the second coming, and uh, we can look at it like a diamond, uh, we'll talk about the rapture, but there are other passages that look at this whole second coming event from a different viewpoint. I'm talking about the parable of the ten virgins. And those of you that have your Bible with you, turn with me to Matthew 25, and we're going to read from verses 1 to 13, and look at this coming of Christ, of Christ from a different viewpoint, get a different reflection on, uh, on what will happen. And uh, what this will bring home to us is that there will be a parting of the ways between the saved and the unsaved, the forgiven and the unforgiven. So let's talk first of all about the need to be ready for the rapture. So... Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. He sure has been a long time so far, right? 2,000 years. Wow. <laughs> the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. And at midnight, I notice, not the daylight, the midnight. Some people are expecting him to come in the daylight. They're not expecting any darkness to have to endure. But at midnight, verse 6, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. 
Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him. I love that. To walk hand in hand with the bridegroom. What a day that will be, my brothers and sisters. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. I don't like that. I have to read it though because the scriptures are true. There is coming a time when the door will be shut and many will be left outside. The door was shut. Verse 11. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said. Open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch. Because you do not know the day or the hour. So as we think about this, what are the two most important truths to take from this passage? In my opinion, the first truth is to always keep watching. And you, my brothers and sisters, are watching. You're seeing what's happening in the world and you're going to the scriptures and asking, Lord, what does this mean? What is happening in the world? The darkness seems to be descending and you haven't come yet, as some people believe. We, we must be ready for when Christ comes. This passage speaks of the return of Christ, the bridegroom, when he comes for his bride, the church. All ten were waiting, but five were unprepared. They came having no oil for their lamps. They were not ready to endure the darkness of the night. This parable is talking about the rapture of the church from a different viewpoint, I believe when only those who are ready will enter the Lord's presence. The most important truth is to be prepared, and I trust that you're all prepared for Christ when he comes. The second most important truth for us to grab a hold of tonight is that the door will be shut. And it will not be reopened for those who would try to come later, that is evident from the passage. They came later. Lord, Lord, enter. Please let me enter. And he said, no, sorry. I don't know you. I cannot think of anything more terrible for a person to believe that they are good enough and to come to that door at the end of time and to have the door shut in front of them. What a terrible words to hear. I'm sorry. The door is now shut. To see a shut door in front of you, there is nothing more horrifying to someone with an expectation of Christianity but have never truly given their lives to Christ. There is a deep sadness about this passage because there are many people that we know, each of us, that are yet outside the door and you kind of know it. You hope that they will hear and respond. But I have people that I know that are yet outside the door, I think. And I cannot imagine, I, I just cannot imagine the screams of those outside while we are inside and seeing their cries. Please, please let me in. The deception of the enemy is so powerful that there are some that think that they're going to get in when the door will be shut. So the Lord brings this all home with that last verse. He summarizes what the parable is all about. Verse 13, Therefore, keep watch, 
because you do not know the day nor the hour. Scary things. Let's read another passage on this topic, for it will help us to understand what will take place at the rapture of the saints. I'm Turn with me to Luke 13, verses 23 to 28. Someone asked him, Jesus, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. I'll ask you a question about that in a minute. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up, and again we hear those terrible words, and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. You see that? There's a door that is open at the moment, but it will be closed at a certain point, and there will be a parting of the ways between the saved and the unsaved. Those who are caught up, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and those who will be left to face the wrath of God. Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Verse 26. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you. You taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. We would all agree that this passage and the one that we've read previously teaches that there will be no second chances, even though there are some that will tell you there'll be a second chance. Do not believe it. We have here, right in front of us, I just read it to you, the door will be closed and people will try to get in. Oh, I need that second chance that I heard some people talk about. There will be no second chances, and I don't want you to think, well, I'm going to put off committing my life to Christ because I've heard that, well, if I miss the, the, the rapture, then I can get in later. It is an untruth. It is deception, brothers and sisters. Here we have the words of Jesus in two different places that the door will be shut and it will not be opened again. There will not be another opportunity for one to gain entrance into the kingdom of God after the door shuts. It is as if God's drawbridge of grace lifts. And those left behind must face the separation of the sheep and the goats, the saved and the unsaved, those who are caught up to be with the Lord forever, and those who are left to face the judgment because they have not received the free gift of eternal life freely offered by the Lord Jesus Christ. At that time, it will not matter what kind of good life you have lived on earth. It will not matter whether you've been to church. Jesus says, I never knew you. Do you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? I ask you that. Only you can tell that, and the Lord, of course. Do not let the enemy deceive you as to that day. If you're not certain, you should be certain. Every one of us here should be certain that when that day comes, you are going to enter through that door. Everything depends on that. I don't want to, I don't want to ever look out and see one or two of you that are on the outside of that door scratching at the door, let me in. Let... Ah, such a horrifying thought. I want you all to know the Lord Jesus Christ and the open door because it is open. Free grace. 
In the second passage that we read too, the bridegroom will say, I don't know you or where you come from, verse 27. Only those who have a relationship with Jesus Christ will go through that door. Jesus himself said, I am the door to the sheepfold, or I am the gate, depending on your translation. God wants you to know that when that day comes, you will enter through that door. John the Apostle wrote these words. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. You know in your Noah. You know what I mean by that? You just know in your inside whether you're right with God or whether you still hold on to your sins, you're still walking your own way, doing your own thing. Paul the Apostle wrote, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So again, I ask you, and maybe I'm laboring the point, but it is such an important point. Do you know him? Will you go through that door on that day? Now was the time to be ready. You should not put off this question for another day. Paul wrote in another place, today is the day of salvation. And today, in another place, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Hebrews 4 verse 7. So here's a question. Get you thinking. In verse 24 of the Luke 13 passage, the second passage that we read, Jesus tells us to enter through the narrow door. Verse 24. What do you think is meant by the narrow door? Why doesn't Jesus just make the door larger? Go for it. I want you to think about it. <laughs> what is the narrow door and why doesn't he make it larger? Go for it. So let's move on. There is only one way to enter life. The narrow way of the Lord Jesus Christ. His way is not an easy way to live one's life. And God's people will go through trials and tribulations, difficulties. For the scripture says in Acts 14.22, we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. God's people have their trials but when God the Father chose to bring forth a bride from the shed blood of the side of his son, he never planned that we should be an untried people. I'm thinking Adam, out of the side of Adam was born Eve. Out of the side of the Lord Jesus was bought the blood, the blood that bought, the bride of Christ came from the side of the Lord Jesus. When we come to the door of life, the only thing that will gain you an entrance into that heavenly kingdom is that of receiving the free gift of eternal life that the Lord Jesus gives. What, what is a gift? What is this gift? It is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Knowing him is eternal life, as he said in John 17, verse 3. He wants to sit on the throne of your life and direct you in his ways while you get to know him intimately. Knowing Christ will get you through that door. Your eternal well-being depends on making it through that door. So having established the importance of getting through that door, I'm belaboring the point, I'm sure. Let's now talk about the rapture and the entrance of God's people to be forever with the Lord. So let's look first of all, the rapture according to Paul the Apostle. Over the last several weeks, we've looked at a number of prophetic passages from Daniel 7, Revelation 13, 
that speak of a time of difficulty for the people of God. We also looked at Daniel 9 verse 27 that talked about a seven-year period where in the middle of that seven-year period will be what's called the abomination of desolation. We talked we talk not last week, but the week before about this abomination of desolation. We looked at three different passages. Paul the Apostle talked about it. Jesus talked about it. And of course, Daniel in 9.27 talked about that event. And we'll look more about that period of time next week. We saw that God's people will go through some persecution at the hands of a world leader that's called in the scriptures the Antichrist, the Beast, the Lawless One, number of names for him in the scriptures. He will call for the world's allegiance and demand that all worship him as God at the midpoint of the seven years, what's called the abomination of desolation. Those who refuse will be persecuted, and that's what Jesus warned about, and we will look at that next week in depth. The sign of loyalty to this world leader is a mark. And those who refuse to put this mark on your hand or your forehead will be persecuted. If you are a Christian and identify with the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom, you will not take this mark. And I would hesitate about taking anything in your body that is different, strange, or whatever. We looked at the possibility that this mark could be an RFID, a radio frequency identification chip. And we'll look at that in two weeks' time when we look closely at the mark of the beast. It is interesting to consider that we have already seen more persecution of Christians in our generation than at any other time in history, including the time of the early church. Some believe that the church will escape the suffering brought on by the Antichrist with the Lord rapturing the church before the Antichrist comes on the scene. This view is called the pre-tribulation rapture. We will go much more into depth on that next week. Those who hold to this teaching believe that the whole seven-year period known as the 70th week of Daniel a week of years, uh, is the tribulation and the wrath of God. I question that the seven-year period is the wrath of God because how can the wrath of God be poured out for seven years when the Antichrist in the middle of the seven years is desecrating the temple? I can't conceive of that and we have no scripture and please, correct me, send me a scripture that you can say categorically that seven years beforehand, the church will go up. I do not believe it, and I will show you categorically over the next few weeks that Jesus himself said in Matthew 24 that it will be after the abomination of desolation. We will look closely at those passages, and of course... Last week, we looked at signs that led, that leads up to the second coming of Christ. So, the Lord encourages us to watch. Watch for the signs, and that was what we brought out last week. Look for the signs. So, first of all, we'll, we will look much more closely at those, those things. What is the rapture? That is an important thing. What is the rapture? The word rapture is a word that, it, that we use to describe the true church, those born again of God, being caught up. Notice I use the word caught up. Because we don't find the word rapture in the scriptures. We use the word rapture because it comes from a Latin word, rapia which means rapid. And the early uh, Catholic Bibles translated the Greek word hapazo, which literally means snatched up. We'll look at it again in a minute. 
And, and they translated it into rapier, which means rapid. And we, 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 we use the word rapture, but we, the, the word itself is not in the scriptures. So what is this word? The word hapazo, we'll look at the passage in a minute. And you, if you want to, you can already be looking. It's in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. But the word that is translated caught up is this Greek word hapazo. So I, I like to explore key words. I have a key word study Bible. Uh, I, I have about 10 different Bibles. I'm greedy, I guess. So I, I examine these things and I look deeply at what different Greek words mean. And the Greek word hapazo that's translated in the passage that we're going to read in a minute literally means snatched, and it's translated caught up. And uh, my keyword study Bible says that it means to strip, spoil, snatch, to seize upon with force, or to rob. It is an open act of confiscatory violence. Get out of here, Beelzebub. <laughs> To snatch or tear away, yank away, pluck out of, remove by swiftly and aggressively grasping. Hmm. The snatching up of God's people by the Lord agrees with what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. We'll look at that towards the end, this passage. But for now, let's just, let me just tell you what verse 52 says. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. How, how quickly does it take to twinkle your eye or to bat your eye in another scripture? To bat your eye, that's how quickly this will take place. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. We'll look at that more deeply in a moment. First, let's examine what Paul says in the uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4 passage. And we will see what the Apostle Paul has to say about the rapture or being caught up. So, are you with me? Verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. Brothers, he's writing to the church, so he's calling them brothers. These are brothers and sisters in the Lord. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. In other words, those who have died in the Lord. Or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we would... Do look at this one. Here's what it says. We believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. My brothers and sisters, your loved ones that have passed on, are with the Lord. Their body may be, their bones may be in the grave, but they are asleep according to the Lord Jesus. They are very much alive and with the Lord. And when Jesus comes, guess what? He will bring with him those who are asleep in the Lord. Isn't that what it just says? Let's go on. Verse 15. According to the Lord's own word, he's saying, look, this is not my thoughts here. This is what the Lord has told me directly. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep, those who have gone to be with the Lord. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. What's, what's he saying? 
he's saying, when the Lord comes, he's going to bring the spirits of your loved ones that are with the Lord. He's going to bring them. And at that moment, their bodies will be raised. They will come up first. They will be changed. Let's carry on reading it. With the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left will be, there's our word, harpazo, caught up, translated into Latin, repair. Will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord only for a little time. No, it doesn't say that. I'm checking on you to find out whether you're listening. How long does it say we're going to be with the Lord from that point? Forever. Thank you. <laughs> and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. We should be greatly encouraged through reading those, not, not just about our loved ones that have already gone on to be with the Lord, but ourselves. That this event will happen. This is not a possibly or maybe. No, this is an event that will be the greatest event in all of human history. Three times in the passage above, Paul writes about those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ. When a person who knows the Lord dies, his body may be in the grave but the person, their spirit, goes on to be with the Lord. Let's move on. Now, Paul continues talking about the coming of Christ in chapter 5. We've just been looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now he carries on into chapter 5. Now, rem remember, the separation of into chapters and verses was not completed until hundreds of years after this passage was written. So Paul is just carrying on his thought about what the rapture is. All right, you with me? He, we know that because he starts off chapter 5 by saying, now. All right, so let's now read it, having understood that. This continuation of thought is evident from his use of the word now. So, verse 1 of chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. Why is he saying that? Because he's got a letter from them asking about the dates. They've got questions about this. This, whole, this church loves the topic of the second coming. Just like the first Corinthians, they loved the whole topic of the gifts. This church, their emphasis, oh, we've we got to understand about these things, about the second coming. So he talked often with them about that. We know that because of what he writes. So let's carry on. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well. Notice that? Why does he say that? Because he went over, he labored this whole point with the church when he was with them. For you know very well. That the day of the Lord, notice that, the day of the Lord, he's putting together with the rapture. The day of the Lord, the rapture is a back-to-back -back event with the day of the Lord. We will escape the wrath of God. The wrath of God starts at the rapture. So let's carry on. For you know, verse 2, very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on who? Them. You notice the change there is no longer us, it's them. Those who do not know Christ, that disregard his word, that have no interest in receiving forgiveness for their sins, Destruction will come on them. Suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, we talked about the labor pains last week, right? 
And they, notice the word they, it's not us, they will not escape. And then he starts talking to them again. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. I have that underlined in your notes, because you need to hold on to that. This change, he's talking about the church will not be surprised. Brothers and sisters, you're here studying this because the Spirit of God is prompting you. You need to understand these things before that time comes. Because many will be oblivious. They're asleep. They're like the five foolish virgins that fell asleep and didn't prepare themselves. But you, brothers, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, spiritually asleep, he's talking about here. But let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled. Putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. Amen. That sounds good to all of us. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation. Let me finish the passage and we'll come back to that word because it's an interesting word. But to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, whether we are with the Lord in heaven and our bodies are in the grave, whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. So, another question. Give you a chance to ponder these things, use the bathroom, get a bottle of water, etc. What main points stand out to you from chapter 5, that last pa passage in the scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 to 11. What are the main points that stand out to you? I'll give you a few moments to discuss those. So, are you still with me? So what main points stand out to us from this passage? Number one that stands out is that just as one does not expect a thief in the night, so destruction will come on them suddenly, those who are non-Christians. Number two, this day of the Lord will not surprise the believers. As the time draws near, there will be much evidence. You will know because of the signs of the times, like we looked at last, last week. Believers will expect his coming, for they are not in darkness. Verse 5 of chapter 5. Number 3. This act of being caught up, as I said, will be a back-to-back -back event with the day of the Lord. That's a question and a half. What is the day of the Lord? We'll look at that in a minute. We'll look at an explicit passage in Isaiah 13 in a minute. Where the church is snatched up and the wrath of God will be poured out on those who have rejected the gospel. Now, I pointed out to you this verse uh, with this one word in verse 9. First Thessalonians 5 verse 9, where it says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation. Now, the Greek word there is soteria, which can mean one of two things, depending on the context. It could mean salvation, as it's most often translated, but it also can mean deliverance. 
Now, I put it to you, brothers and sisters. He is writing to a church of solid believers that are understanding things about the second coming. These are all born-again believers. So he's not talking about salvation. He's talking about deliverance. Deliverance from the enemy, from the Antichrist. The deliverance he's talking about is the rapture. When those who trust in the Lord are caught up, that is true deliverance from the hands of the Antichrist who will be persecuting the saints. Paul is writing to believers, so it should more logically be translated as deliverance. This deliverance gives confidence to the thought that the snatching away, the rapture, happens during a time when the Antichrist is persecuting the saints. We know from the Lord Jesus, because he says, when you see, therefore, the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, let him understand what we're talking about, my paraphrase, uh, then let him who is in Jerusalem get out, get out of the city, for then there will be great tribulation. We'll look at that further, that, that Greek word, and look at it more in depth. But the great tribulation is a time of great persecution against all godly people that will not bow the knee to Antichrist, will not take his mark. You will be persecuted if we are the, that generation that's called to endure that time. I notice that the scriptures talk about a war in heavenly places. Revelation 12, verse 7, talks about a war in heaven. And the result of this war will be that Satan will be cast down to the earth along with his angels. Revelation 12, verse 9. We don't have enough time to get in depth with that. I want to, at some point, do uh, a study all the way through the book of Revelation. I've already written it, and it's online for those of you that want to explore the whole book of Revelation. It's all free. They're free downloads. I just need to put it in a video form uh, so that we can put it out there for all those across the world that are looking for some teaching on this whole subject of this book. But the effect of Satan being thrown down is that he will make war against believers. Here's what it says in verse 17. Revelation 12, verse 17, I quote, Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. This is obviously believers. They testify as to who the Lord Jesus is. And who's making war against them? The dragon, Satan, the Antichrist. Woe is pronounced on the earth because the devil has been cast down. In Revelation 12, verse 12. The devil's fury at being cast down. And the Lord will descend for his people at the rapture and will cut short this tribulation or great persecution that will last how long we don't know. No man knows the day nor the hour, as we have said. This deliverance takes place before the outpouring of God's wrath. The scriptures Call this time, the time of God's wrath, the day of the Lord. He will snatch up believers to himself before his wrath is poured out on his enemies. So, what is the day of the Lord? It is the day of God's vengeance upon his enemies. When justice will begin, when those who have cried out for justice will begin to see judgment on God's enemies and on our enemies. We will be, those who are around for that time, will be going through a time of persecution. 
And this will be a time of destruction on those who worship the beast, have taken the mark, the number of his name, and uh, God will bring justice. We're talking about Revelation 14, verses 9 to 10, where it talks about the judgment on those who will take that mark and worship the beast, the Antichrist. So let's now look at this passage in Isaiah, because Isaiah, he puts plainly before us what is the day of the Lord. We only have time to look at one explicit passage, but there are a number of passages in the Old Testament and in the New which talks about the day of the Lord. So Isaiah 13, I'm going to read from verse 6. Wail, the prophet says, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp. Every man's heart will melt. We're talking about the unbelievers. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish will grip them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at each other. Their faces are aflame. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy who? The sinners within it. Verse 10, this coincides with other passages, especially in Matthew 24. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. I will make man scarcer than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. And again, I remind you, this happens just after the rapture of the saints. The day of the Lord will come with cosmic signs in the heavens. Verse 10 tells us that. Things happening in the sun moon and stars, but I will remind you, God did not appoint us to wrath, to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's move on. We will know the season, but not the day or the hour. Some say that no one will be expecting the rapture when it occurs. They say it could happen at any time. This teaching is called the doctrine of imminency. Those who hold to this line of teaching believe that there are no prophesied events to occur before the church is caught away. They assume that the rapture could happen any minute. Like a thief is not expected, They say that Christ will come at an unexpected time. But Jesus said that his people would know the season of time, but not the exact day or hour. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven. If we took just that scripture, we would think as talking about, we won't know. This doctrine of imminency must must be true but not when you put it in context. And often those that will quote that passage will not give you the whole passage. Let's read the whole passage. For this is found in Matthew 25, and it's the Lord Jesus that's teaching it. And he starts off this whole thought about the timing and the season, not the day nor the hour, I remind you, but we will know the season. Let's read the passage from uh, verse 32, Matthew 24. I said 25, didn't I? It was Matthew 24, 32 to 36. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. 
as soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. What is summer? The coming of Christ. He's typifying the coming of Christ as summer. Even so, when you see all these things, note, note that. When you see all these things. We, we talked about all these things last week. We're not going to go over old ground. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. There's that door again that we have to, we're, we're going to be faced with that door where some are going to be shut out from that door. It is near right at the door. Truly, whenever the Lord says truly, we, we should always take his words as true, but he is emphasizing truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. We haven't got time to get into that. We've looked at that previously when we've looked at the parable of the fig tree. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or the hour, no one knows not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Again, we won't know the day nor the hour, but the whole passage is about that we will know the season because we're looking at the signs that precede his coming. The signs of the times will tell those expecting his coming that summer is near, which is the coming of Christ. Otherwise, what would be the parable's point? <laughs> the parable gives hope to those who are enduring that time that they can look ahead and know when we see these things happening, we can know, hey, look, Jesus is coming soon. We're seeing the signs. They're all lining up. And it is a parable to excite our hearts and remind us that whatever we're enduring at that time, it's only going to be for a short period of time because the Lord will cut short that period of time through salvation or deliverance by snatching us up. Scripture says that those who belong to Christ will be aware of what is happening. In a parallel passage, Luke also writes these words. I'm looking at Luke 21, verse 28. When these things, again, those things that we looked at last week, Luke is clarifying again. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. What, what's he talking about? That's my next question I want you to discuss. Here's the question, question three. What does it mean for our redemption to draw near? What should you expect to happen if you are a believer and in that time of persecution? Go for it. Give you a few minutes. Ponder it. So, the question is, what should you expect to happen if you are a believer and in that time of persecution? What should you expect? You should expect the coming of the Lord, and he will come for his purchased possession. What do I mean? 2,000 years ago, he bought you at the cross. If you're a believer... You are not your own. You were bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus Christ, the substitutionary sacrifice for you and as you. The Lord Jesus bore your sin and my sin that someday he will come for what he or who he has purchased. The purchased possession. What joy that day will be when it happens, and it will happen, a 
as surely as tomorrow sun will come up, this day will happen where we will be transformed in an instant. Which leaves us with a question. How will I be changed at the rapture? As we have said, when Christ comes at the rapture, hapazo, caught up, there will be those who are, who are with the Lord, our brothers and sisters who have passed on before us, will have their bodies come up from the grave and be uni reunited with their spirit in the air with the Lord. And then we who are on the Lord, uh, who are on the earth at that time, if we are that generation, will also be caught up to be with the Lord. John chapter 5 writes this, verse 28 and 29. And this is the Lord Jesus speaking. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. What? I thought they were dead. <laughs> they will come alive in some miraculous way. I don't know. I, don't, I, I can't explain everything, but it's there in the scriptures. And God, it is impossible for him to lie. And he says, in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, verse 29, and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. There's the parting between the, the forgiven and the, those who are not forgiven. This event is called the resurrection of the dead or the first resurrection. There are two resurrections. The first will be at the rapture, where the dead in Christ will rise first, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 to 18. We already read it earlier. Then those who are still alive on earth will go up to meet the Lord in the air with a new glorious body as God transforms us in the batting of an eyelid's time, or as the scripture says, in the twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians 15, 42. How blessed will be those that experience this rapture or resurrection. We look at it from different passages. Some places call it the resurrection, and other passages call it the rapture. Here's, here's what Revelation says about this point. Revelation 20, verses 4 to 5. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Verse 5 in brackets. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. So some passages call the rapture the first resurrection, and other passages it's the rapture. The second resurrection is one of judgment for those who reject God's offer of a pardon for their sins. This second resurrection will occur after the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ at what is called the Great White Throne Judgment, Revelation 20, verses 7 to 12. Now let's turn to what Daniel says about this event, the resurrection, the first resurrection, or the rapture. We're looking at things, different viewpoints, like a diamond, different prophets have seen different aspects of the same event when we are changed, raptured, resurrection, whatever you want to call it. Here's what Daniel says, Daniel 12, verses 1 to 4. At that time, what time? The distress. At that time, Michael, the great prince, the archangel we're talking about now, 
the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress. There's our tribulation. NIV calls it distress. King James Version calls it tribulation. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Verse 2. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Verse 3. Those who are wise, I kind of look around the room and see those who are wise, that seeking out these things, understanding these things. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. For you, Daniel, roll up the scroll and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Wow, is that an understatement of the increase of knowledge? But the scroll was bound up because he couldn't understand it. He asked, God, give me some understanding. No, no, well, you seal up the words. At the time of the end, men and women will begin to understand what we're talking about. And I trust, as I'm looking at the room and through those who are listening and watching on the video, you're beginning to have your eyes opened to the warfare that is going on in this world. There is a spiritual warfare, and God is awakening the eyes of the church and preparing us ahead of time for that period of time. At the first resurrection or rapture, believers in Christ are clothed with a resurrection body that will be similar to Christ's resurrection body. I believe there will be some continuity between our old facial features, but we are talking about an imperishable body, a body raised with the glory of God shining from us. will be like the sun, as we just read. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. Let's look at what Paul the Apostle taught concerning this in his first Corinthian letter. We're talking now about what will it be like? What will we look like? What will this transformation be like? And Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians 15. It's a bit of reading, but hang with me. It's well worth reading. I labored about whether I put this in your notes because it's a long piece. But then after all, I'm doing the reading, so you can just listen, okay? Here's what it says, but it's well worth exploring and getting your thinking caps on and holding on to this scripture when we're talking about what the rapture will be like. Let's, let's read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm reading from verse 35 through to 45 at first. Verse 35, but someone may ask, how are the dead raised? It's almost like they're scoffing. Ah, how, how can that ever happen? How are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish, Paul writes. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he is determined, to, and to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. He's talking about this seed, right? You're with me here. He's saying that this is just a seed that we're putting into the ground, and, and that seed breaks open, right? When you plant the seed of corn, something happens. It just doesn't just die. The life that's inside the seed comes forth, and the body that comes from the seed is very different from the seed. He's talking about this body that's 
just a seed that is sown. Let's carry on reading. Verse 39. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. And star differs from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. <laughs> it's weak and it's fading. And the older I get, uh, the harder it gets. It is to get up in the morning, right? It's, it's perishable. He clarifies it for us. It's perishable. The body that is sown is perishable, but it is raised imperishable. Verse 43. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Oh, I like that. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. If you've got a natural body, my brothers and sisters, you are also going to have a spiritual body when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. Verse 45. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam... A life-giving spirit. What's he talking about? There have been two federal heads of the human race. Adam, what happened to Adam happened to all of us. We kind of don't like that we have a natural, physical, weak, perishable body. But we, we inherited Adam's sin. What happened to him happened to all of us. But there is also another federal head of the human race that came on the scene. His name is Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. What happened to him will also happen to all of us. And that's what Paul is getting to. He says the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life giving spirit. What's he talking about? When you come to Christ, you receive new life. You were born again or born from above. That passage means born from again, uh, uh, born again or born from above. Let me carry on. Let's read a little bit further because he clarifies. Verse 46. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural the physical body, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the man from heaven, he's talking about the Lord Jesus, I'm sure you're with me, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep the sleep of death. Some of us, when Jesus comes, some of us will still be alive on planet Earth if we are that generation. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. We'll look at that word in a minute. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. I look forward to that day, right? For the perishable, 
must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's carry on. We don't have enough time for the question. That which is on the outside, your godly character will someday be revealed. That which God is transforming you to be will suddenly be on the outside. At the moment, we cannot see one another's character. But there is coming a time when that will all change. Just like the seed has to crack and the life come out. That which is on the inside that God has been working on, on the inside of your life, over your lifetime, will be revealed and it will be glorious, my brothers and sisters. It will no longer be perishable, but imperishable. Verse 53. We won't all sleep. By that we're talking about not all Christians will be separated from their bodies. There will be some who are transformed instantly without going through the experience of death. Well, that sounds good. <laughs> when Christ comes in a flash, in the batting of an eye's time, we will be changed from having a perishable body to being clothed with an imperishable body. Paul also talks about this. Short, short scripture. Philippians 3 verses 20 to 21 says this. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. Who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform, there's that passage again, changed, transformed, our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. The Greek word translated into our English word transform is the Greek word metaschematizo. It is a construction of two Greek words. Meta means a change of place or condition and schema implies shape or outward form. It literally means to be transformed, to change the outer, outer form or appearance of something, to refashion or reshape. An imperishable body means you won't get old or get sick. Our new bodies will be glorious all the time. You will have youthful strength and be radiantly beautiful with God's glory radiating from you. Just as Jesus walked through the walls of the upper room and surprised the disciples that night when the door was locked for fear of the Jews, we'll be able to pass through walls and travel instantaneously, not bound by the physical realm. Paul writes that our new body will be like Christ's glorious body, Philippians 3, 20. This radiance that accompanies us will be authoritative and beautiful. Jesus said that the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, Matthew 13, verse 43. I kind of like the sound of that. I don't know about you, but I long for that day. There will be power and authority to work miraculously just like our Lord does. God will be able to trust us with such potential, for we have been tested through daily experiences in this world. Our transformation will be awesome. Our bodies will be raised we will see his face and be transformed into his image. Oh, 
oh, what a glorious day that will be. Would you stand with me? Let's, let's pray. Oh, God, I want that. I need that transformation. I want you in my life, Lord, leading and guiding me. I turn around from sin. If you've never received Christ, this is a prayer that you can pray. I turn around from sin and trust that your death was for me and as me to cleanse me from all sin as a sacrificial substitute. Please forgive me, Lord, and help me to live for you. I receive the gift of eternal life that Jesus bought for me at the cross.